Pope Francis says the U.S. is causing the climate crisis and we all need to stop being so darn prosperous. Plus, the new president-elect of Argentina campaigned against Team Francis and won the election with a vice president who's a Latin mass Catholic. Meanwhile, Dinesh D'Souza blasts Pope Francis, as does Jordan Peterson, and Cardinal Burke says it would be a miracle if anything good comes from Francis' synod on synodality. Keep resisting, folks. This could be the beginning of the end of the Francis Revolution. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Michael Matt, and this is the Remnant Underground. Happy Thanksgiving weekend to you all. Well, bad news. Another one bites the dust. The Archbishop of St. Louis has closed the Church of St. Barnabas, which is a growing traditional Latin mass parish. Of course, we're seeing this happening all across the country. God knows why. This parish offers the Latin mass. The mass, for those of you who are not Catholic, this is the liturgy, the mass of the Western Rite, the Latin Rite that every pope for 2,000 years has been offering, but it's not right for Pope Francis, not good enough for him. This would be the Mass, for example, that Saint Michael, Father Michael Pro, would have offered, all the Cristeros would have offered every day before they were martyred down in Mexico, the priests who were martyred down there, many of them were, just 100 years ago, not long ago. Now this church in St. Louis, 35% of the congregation of St. Barnabas is composed of children, young families, children, 35%. Booming parish, zero debt. A priest who comes in from the outside, so there isn't even need for the diocese to pay him. But, too bad, so sad, Francis tells us the Latin Mass is disruptive to unity in the church, and it's just gotta go. Now here is an example of the sort of liturgy that Evidently, according to Team Francis, fosters the sort of unity that's needed in today's church. So tonight I want to try once again, friends, to reach out to you, to those, those of you, and I don't know how many are, are left in this audience who fit this bill, but to those of you who refuse to accept what is happening to the Catholic Church. This morning, Pope Francis shaking up the Catholic Church, supporting same-sex civil unions in the new documentary, Francesco. The Pope says what we have to create is a civil union law. That way they are legally covered. I stood up for that. Many of you are critics of what we're trying to do, what traditional, uh, traditional Catholics are doing, you simply are afraid to face the reality of what's happening to the church that you love. And I really get that because I hate, the rea I hate facing the reality of my beloved church as a baptized cradle Catholic. It's horrific. Amen. What we're all looking at right now is the infiltration of the Catholic Church at the highest levels. So I want to have this discussion tonight. I want to try to reach you, appealing mostly to authority, to people in authoritative positions in the Church, but also culturally, who are looking at what's happening in the Vatican and they're saying something is demonically amiss. So first, a word from our sponsor. Tonight's sponsor, the sponsor of tonight's Remnant Underground is Charity Mobile, our friends at Charity Mobile, the pro-life phone company. No contracts to sign right now for a limited time. New customers who mention the offer code Remnant TV get a free phone with free activation plus free shipping. Couldn't be any simpler. And the great thing is that when you sign up with Charity Mobile, 5% of your monthly plan price goes to the pro-life, pro-family charity of your choice. And on that list is the Remnant Foundation. So call Charity Mobile today. That's at one 877-474-3662 or chat, them, chat with them online at CharityMobile.com. That's CharityMobile.com. Now, let's just get down to it. I really, truly, honestly, and sincerely get it. You don't want to hear that the present occupant of the Chair of St. Peter is dismantling the Catholic Church. Now, he puts it in the terms of we are going to reform the Church. We're going to reset the Church, right? 
But what he has to do in order to do that is dismantle the entire Catholic Church as it's been known liturgically, doctrinally, in every way for 2,000 years. Bishop Thomas Tobin asking for clarification, writing the Pope's words clearly contradicts long-standing teaching of the Church and that it cannot support the acceptance of objectively immoral relationships. But many people, when they're confronted with this, would simply rather, to use the old expression, they would simply rather shoot the messenger. I cannot hear you, I cannot see you, right? That's what they would prefer to do. So they denounce this show, they denounce me, for example, amongst many others, as a Pope hater, and all you want to do is beat up on the Pope. And as I said, as a cradle Catholic, why would I want to do this? If there weren't a massive problem in Rome, why would any of us be doing this? <laughs> and so they say, well, you're a modern day Martin Luther. <laughs> you know what, that's what you are. You're no better than Martin Luther. So, as I said, I'm gonna have a conversation about this, addressing some of the complaints that are leveled against us. So let's start with that one. Let's take a look at Martin Luther for a moment. Now, Martin Luther, he was a Catholic priest who defected from the church. He's, a, he's an apostate, but more importantly, he's a heretic. You understand the difference, right? Traditional Catholics, we question not one doctrine of the Catholic Church, and no one accuses us of, of, of doing so. Not exactly Martin Luther. Martin Luther denied the theology of the papacy, the right of the pope to exist, the power of the pope. He, de he denied the institution, finally, as a corruption while we're defending the papacy and the theology of the papacy vigorously. A little different, isn't it? Martin Luther rewrote the Bible. He eliminated books of the Bible, and by the time he was done, he eliminated four out of seven of the sacraments instituted by Christ to give grace. He eliminated sacraments, friends. When's the last time you heard of a traditional Catholic suggesting we eliminate sacraments or change the Bible to fit our bill? or have the Pope adopt our novel new understanding of Christianity. Now, all we're saying is we want to practice the faith as we always have, as it was taught to us in Catholic schools. Martin Luther broke his vows as an Augustinian monk, and he married a nun who had also broken her vows. It's like a traditional Catholic to you. Martin Luther started his own church. Well, what are we doing? We're begging Francis to keep ours Catholic. You must be able to see the difference here, right? <laughs> but okay, just for the sake of argument, let's say that, you know, we're just laymen. We're not theologians. Maybe we're wrong. Maybe we're dead wrong to resist the novelties of Francis, Team Francis, and the Synod on Synodality, and Pachamama. Maybe we're just wrong. You know, just obstinate. But what do you do with hierarchical authority who feel the same way that we do? A serious question, what do you do with that? You're just gonna keep eliminating everybody who comes out and speaks against what's happening in the Vatican, for example, Cardinal Gerhard Muller, top theologian, head of the CDF under Benedict. He's gonna be one of your schismatics in a few days. One more thing, and he's a schismatic too. You see, this is classic shooting the messenger that you're involved with, those of you who are critics of, of the fact that we're criticizing, we're upset, we're resisting what's happening. Is, is Cardinal Muller a, a schismatic for warning against Francis's hostile takeover of the Catholic Church? Being this is a system of self-revelation and is a, the occupation of the Catholic Church is a, is a hostile takeover mm -hmm. of the Church of Jesus Christ. You're arguing that he's, he's just, uh, he's wrong too? He's a schismatic too? Who, who, who does he think he is? What if he's right? What if he's right? How about Cardinal Robert Serra? Yet another schismatic for saying, as he just said a couple days ago, today, and I'm quoting, today, the crisis of the church has entered a new phase, the crisis of the magisterium, he said. Another schismatic? Another idiot? Another rad trad? Another cardinal? that you're gonna throw under the bus because you can't handle the truth? Cardinal Sarah, just a couple of weeks ago, I was there, sat, sat in the room and listened to the man speak. He stood with those who are resisting what's happening, resisting the synod on synodality. Just the other night, we were in Rome. And when he offered a full-throated endorsement of Bishop Schneider's work, of his new catechisms, Defending Bishop Schneider, oh yes, that Bishop Schneider, the uh, 
schismatic. It is for love for him, for real brotherly love. And I will tell him, Holy Father, I am your best friend. I have never prayed so much for no one in my life as for Pope Francis, really. And yet you're ready to push Bishop Schneider off the cliff because he's a schismatic, he's resisting. You see how ridiculous it's getting? That's not, doesn't stop there. How about Cardinal Raymond Burke? Cardinal Burke, in 2021, the dicastery of the doctrine of the faith issued a response to a question, a dubium, about whether the church has the authority to bless unions of persons of the same sex. The response given was a simple and customary one word answer, no. Now, according to this October 2nd answer to your formal question, Pope Francis reportedly says, we'll put it on the screen, we cannot be judges who only deny, push back and exclude. Pastoral prudence must adequately discern whether there are forms of blessing requested by one or more persons that do not transmit a mistaken conception of marriage. Your Eminence, though he says the bishops' conferences should not establish this as a rule, he is saying it should be left up to pastors. This seems to contradict the prior ruling of the Vatican Doctrinal Office. Is it now permissible for the church to bless same-sex unions? Well, you cannot. The point, and we, we raise it in the dubium uh, with regard to the, I think it's number three, with regard to the same-sex unions, uh, you cannot bless uh, sinful acts. You, you cannot bless uh, a relationship which... Uh, in itself uh, is involved with with intrinsically evil acts and and therefore it's it's not possible to to bless these unions in any way now this comes from a canon lawyer a top theologian in the church who recently noted now in reference to this thing and to what we're talking about tonight he said quote the great irony is that those of us who are insisting on what the church has always and everywhere taught are now accused of schism. And the confusion that's coming out of this whole synodal process, this is what's leading to division and schism. Cardinal Burke's a, yeah, pretty much a schismatic, right? Austin Ivory, Pope's biographer who writes, Archbishop Lefebvre, he also led a schism following Vatican II. Burke rejects synodality now. So again, how, how, how many of these hierarchical messengers are you prepared to shoot just to keep from having to face the horrific reality of what's happening to the Catholic Church? Huh? Well, it's not just prelates. You know that, right? Look around you. Look what people are saying, people of, of influence, many, many non-Catholics, non-Catholic cultural icons. They're really struggling with this pope, right? Jordan Peterson, for example, he tweets out, turn your attention back to the salvation of souls, Francis, and lead the celebration of Baal and Gaia to the pagans. Now, when you start seeing some of this, you have to admit that at the very least, Francis is a terrible pope. He's, a, he's doing a terrible job at reaching people. He's just scandalizing people of influence. People are not even Catholics all across the world. Now, I think he's doing all this on purpose, but you... If you're still siding with Team Francis, you at least have to say, gee, I wish we had a more effective uh, spokesman for this thing because Francis is just uh, alienating everybody, including the non-Catholics, right? In fairness, you'd have to at least say that. Dinesh D'Souza, he's another one. Regarding this unbelievable latest Francis scandal, let's take a look. Hello. Hello. You're looking at that and you're saying that's all good because he's trying to um, be like Jesus, right? But way down deep in your heart, you know that's not true, don't you? This has nothing to do with converting anybody. This has everything to do with equity and inclusion in the Catholic Church taking no serious moral stand against anything. <laughs> As we go along, it gets worse. But you just saw the bus load there, right? So Dinesh D'Souza, looking at that, 
ask the obvious question that millions of people, if they take the time at all, most people are just walking away from the Catholic Church, like whatever, they're nuts. But if they take the time at all to look at it, they're going to ask this question. Is the Pope evangelizing these people to go home and sin no more? Or is he encouraging them, affirming their disorder? I see no evidence that he is trying to get them out of this lifestyle. And that's the difference between Francis and Christ. From the outside looking in, D'Souza is not a Catholic. He's just another scandalized guy scandalized by the antics of the Pope of Mercy, who everybody can see through, apart from the little useful idiot water carriers, <laughs> I'm sorry, like Austin Ivory, who will do anything, the little jackals who will do anything for a little upward mobility in the Vatican. <laughs> They'll sell their soul to the devil to keep those positions that they got. I'm sorry, but I've had enough now. I think a lot of people have, because now, well, there are some rumblings. Even the USCCB is coming under uh, attack a little bit, coming into the papal crosshair, shall we say. You know, they just took out Bishop Strickland, one of their own. The Vatican just, just chopped him right out, right? This was the guy who went, asked a few too many questions about what Cardinal McCarrick was doing <laughs> a few years ago, the greatest sexual predator in the history of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, right? Well, Strickland got a little too close to asking too many questions. He's gone. No, no, no due process. He didn't. He wasn't even accused of violating some canonical, you know, ordinance, some law. They just chopped him, saying the wrong things, got rid of him. Which, according to canon lawyer, canon lawyer Father Gerald Murray, quote, took place without a trial and in violation of canonical norms. Another schismatic, right, Austin? But now Francis is evidently preparing to come after any of the other bishops, the American bishops, who he doesn't quite think are on full board here, fully on board with his little revolution. And I saw this, I saw this in Rome when we were covering the synod, the Vatican press office. You kind of feel it. You can feel it. And then some of the journalists, the more lefty, you know, center lefty journalists, were kind of confirming it. A guy like Christopher Lamb from the tablet, he actually, and I was sitting right behind him, the Vatican press office, and Christopher Lamb, he suggested that the president of the USCCB is to blame for the fact that less than 1% of Catholics took part in the Synod on Synod He's like, hey, you know what, man, it's probably because you weren't pushing it enough, right? Because no Catholics are, <laughs> the majority of Catholics are not interested in the stupid synod on synodality. Well, it's the bishop's fault, the head of the USCCB, for not pushing synodality enough, don't you know? <laughs> All Bishop Berlio's fault for not getting down with synodality. Plus, let's not forget, at the synod, during one of the press conferences, again, I was right there, heard it with my own ears, Bishop Berlio committed another capital crime. He defended the Latin Mass Catholics in front of the entire Vatican press corps. They should be, see more inclusion uh, in the synodal process, thank you. In terms of uh, those who, you know, who are attracted to the traditional form of, of, uh, of the mass, um, I think the church is big enough for, for everyone. And I think that certainly their fervor, um, their devotion to family life, their attention to passing on the uh, teachings of the church to their children. I think those are all things that can enrich all of us. And now, wouldn't you know, yeah, they're, gonna, they're coming after him. Archbishop Timothy Brolio is fighting back after Francis's papal nuncio, Cardinal Christophe Pierre, gave an interview to America Magazine, of course, in which he took the U.S. bishops to task, saying that the bishops, the U.S. bishops, must change their pastoral approach to evangelization. Now this is pretty funny, because you know what I think of the U.S. bishops for the most part, <laughs> a hapless lot at best. But even that, even those guys, to the extent that they're keeping the faith and they want to at least keep abortion you know, as something that they care about and, and def you know, defend against, uh, even that's becoming too much for the Team France's equity and inclusion revolution as we all get ready for Agenda 2030 and the Great Reset. <laughs> So yeah, he's, he's, the, the, the nuncio's going after, going after the U.S. bishops for not doing enough. You gotta change their pastoral approach, right? And this is from a guy who thinks that we're, well, we're just a tiny bit too hard on our pro-abort friends. For example, he said, I am pro-life. If you are not pro-life, you become your enemy. And, uh, and we forget that to be pro-life is also 
to help the people concretely, not just to defend an idea, not to, to embrace a political party which is pro-life, you know. So uh, even if people don't share your idea, but you, he's not your enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know, Excellency. Uh, maybe the pro-aborts are not your enemy, but I'll bet all the millions of babies who are getting slaughtered in their mother's wombs right now, I bet they might be just a bit ready to disagree with you on that. They may see the pro-aborts as a problem, even, dare I say, their mortal enemy. <laughs> and, and, and because the bishops, this is, this is rich, because the bishops don't take synodality serious enough, according to Cardinal, uh, Cardinal Pierre, this is why mass attendance in the United States is down. <laughs> and why, he says, incredibly, and I'm quoting now, he says, most of our young priests dream about wearing the cassock and celebrating mass in the traditional way, but almost nobody goes to church. Religious sisters have disappeared and seminaries are now empty. Now, so this comes from the liturgical Gestapo, liturgical Gestapo, which is shutting down, as we just showed you at the top of this show, shutting down most of the thriving parishes in our country. And by the way, he says, he says, we're not going to Mass anymore because we're not being, you know, synodal. Well, yeah, it's terrible what's happening to Mass attendance statistics in the United States, but eminence were, I think, the top. I think the U.S. right now is 31% of Americans go to Mass. They say they go to Mass every single Sunday. <laughs> Versus 15%, I think it is, in Italy, in Francis's Italy. And that seems high to me, 15%, 18% in Italy. In many other countries, much worse. In France, much worse in terms of Novus Ordo mass attendance. And all of this is to say nothing, of course. He talks about if you don't, they're not embracing synodality, and that's why the seminaries are empty. You just noticed? I mean, this happened some time ago, Eminence. You just noticed now, since we all started about hearing about synodality? And all of this is to say nothing about the seminary in one Tyler, Texas which is packed full of seminarians. I think they had 20 this year in a tiny little diocese of Thailand. Now, why do you suppose that is? Huh. Go figure. But no, says the nuncio. The U.S. bishops are dragging their feet on synodality, and that's the biggest problem in the church today. They're not doing enough about climate change either. <laughs> climate change, yes, yes. And here, of course, the good cardinal is clearly and obviously doing the bidding of Pope Francis and the globalist cabal, because Francis writes in his latest climate hysterical encyclical Laudate Deum, he writes, quote, if we consider that emissions per individual in the United States are about two times greater than those of individuals living in China and about seven times greater than the average of the poorest countries, we can state that a broad change in the irresponsible lifestyle connected with the Western model would have a significant long-term impact. Ah, I see. It's our fault. We gotta get those EVs going. We gotta stop eating beef. We gotta get rid of the cows. We gotta get rid of those air conditioners and plastic straws. It's our fault. Too much prosperity here in this country. We're the ones to blame. Wow, that's brilliant. But you see what's coming here, right? When the climate lockdowns kick in, and of course I've been predicting, like along with a lot of other people, that's, at, that's inevitable. They'll come up with climate lockdowns next. Good old Francis will bless those lockdowns with all of his little popey might. Just wait and see. He's just waiting on his orders from Davos <laughs> and Bill Gates. Now, why is this all happening? Well, we've talked about that a lot down here. But I think it's very interesting that Cardinal Christophe Pierre, the papal nuncio, Francis's nuncio to the United States, that he let the cat out of this bag when his effort to go after the, rigid, the rigidity of the U.S. bishops for not being down with synodality enough, the poor man let the cat out of the bag in this, I'm talking about this America Magazine interview. Because his eminence said that a majority of U.S. bishops are ignorant. No, he said, ignorant of what's going on in their own continent, he says. And he goes on, and I quote, I was astounded that many of the bishops didn't know what had happened in a parasita. Now, what is a parasita? Well, it's the parasita conference that his eminence is referring to. This took place back in May of 2007 in the city of a parasita, Brazil. 
we'll get to that in a moment. It concluded with the signing of what's called the Aparasita Document, which is all about, you guessed it, social justice, advocating for a preferential option for the poor, and addressing inequality, inequity, and poverty. Okay? Recuerda que Jesús... As part of his World Youth Day visit to Brazil, Pope Francis held a meeting with bishops of Latin America's Episcopal Conference, also known as Salam. During his speech, the Pope talked about the Aparecida document that was drafted back in 2007. That document includes the situation of the church in Latin America, and it specifically outlines goals to revitalize the faith. According to his sniveling little biographer, Austin Ivory, the Parasita document even underlies the entire Francis program. For once, I agree with Austin. Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio, back in 2007, led the committee that drafted the document, and he has since called it, Francis has since called it, the, quote, roadmap the entire church can use because its principal tenets are living with the simplicity and humility taught in the gospel, a preferential option for the poor and marginalized, and a serious concern for the environment, of course. Now, three of Francis's defining documents, the defining documents of his papacy, were heavily inspired by the Aparecida document, Amoris Laetitia, Laudato Si, and Evangelii Gaudium. Okay? It was the blueprint also for the Amazon Synod and it rests firmly on the foundations of, you guessed it, the Catacombs Pact. 92-year-old Father Luigi Batazzi is the last known survivor of a secret pact that experts say may have influenced Pope Francis. Signed 50 years ago at the time of Vatican II by Catholic bishops in this underground church in Rome. Called the Pact of the Catacombs, it vowed to create a poor church for the poor. Now, they also vowed to put pressure on international organizations to help change the economic structures which they said exploit the poor. These are all points that are remarkably similar to Pope Francis's agenda for the church today. Authored by Brazilian Bishop Helder Camara, a self-proclaimed socialist. He was born in 1909, he died 90 years later, an extremely influential person in South America and in the church in general. The self-identified socialist, Archbishop from Brazil, whom Francis would declare a servant of God in 2015. He's an advocate of liberation theology, of course. He's the Bishop of the Slums. <laughs> Starting to sound familiar? Well, it should. He is the role model of one Jorge Mario Bergoglio. He attended all four sessions of the Second Vatican Council and even played a significant role in drafting Gaudium et Spes, one of the 16 document documents of Vatican II, on the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world, which now, according to Monsignor Gherardini, professor of the ecclesiology at the Pontifical Lateran University, makes the church one speak one speaker among many others, and robs her of the nature of Sacramentum Christi and of her subsequent responsibility concerning eternal salvation. Now, we have gone over and over and over this. In fact, I'll put two links down below, the original Catacombs Pact video that we did a couple years ago, and the one that we just did in Rome a couple weeks ago, in which, once again, the council father, or the, the, the synod fathers, the synod, synod on synodality fathers, went to the catacomb and renewed the catacombs pact once again. So you know what it is, but I want you to just remember one little aspect that puts it all together, connects all the dots, as we've explained before. The catacombs pact was authored by the mentor of one, Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum. I, I give you one example which for me was probably a crucial moment in my life. I traveled for the first time uh, to Brazil. I met a priest uh, who was known at that time as the priest of the poor people. Hmm. Uh, his name was Don Elder Camara. And he brought me to the favelas of uh, Recife and I was so shocked. And I said, I have to invite this bishop to Davos. Is it beginning to get clear? See what's happening here? 
You understand now why the papal nuncio is out there scolding the United States Bishops Conference, chastising the U.S. bishops for failing to get behind the program here, this socialist green program based as it is <laughs> on the Pact of the Catacombs. Friends, this is, this is revolution whether you want to admit it or not. It's a massive revolution based first on the infiltration and now revolution in the church. This is infiltration. And burying our heads in the sand is simply not an option anymore. Not if you want to call yourself Catholic. You just simply got to stop with this because you don't want to hear it. It upsets you. You feel like it scandalizes you. You just should rather just go along with everything rather than question Team Francis. You got to stop with this. You got to stop. This is a crisis that the church has never seen. The world has never seen. It's an unprecedented crisis in the church. Yeah, some say, but, well, resistance is futile, so why even bother? We can't do anything about it. But you see, this is so wrong, friends. I've told you so many times what it was like back in the early 1970s when they said the traditional Latin mass was abrogated and everything was crazy and felt banners and guitars and bulldozed sanctuaries and women and everything going crazy. And they said the Latin mass is gone forever. Who do you think you are? Are you more Catholic than the Pope? Zip it. Quit it. You sound like Martin Luther. Heard it all before. And yet when Benedict XVI took the throne of St. Peter, the mass, the traditional Latin mass, came roaring back onto the altars of the Catholic Church. Why? Because God is in charge, right? And because people resisted. Good and faithful Catholics resisted the attempted, destruct, attempted destruction of the Latin mass and abrogation of the Latin mass, right? So resistance is not futile. It's not futile. I just came back from Rome. I totally disagree with those who say there's nothing we can do. Things are happening right now in dramatic fashion. Look at the Synod on Synodality. They struck out. Poor little Jimmy Martin is all upset. Oh boy, they didn't do any blessings of gay unions. Well, next time, next year, right? They're all upset. They struck out, friends, because of the resistance, formal resistance that was raised by you, by me, by Cardinal Burke, by a whole bunch of prelates, priests, bishops, cardinals, archbishops, right? Uh, and so to say you're having a synod on synodality, the word never existed in the church, but to have a synod on synod, is, 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 it doesn't make any sense. But what, so what's happening is it's being used to promote a whole series of, uh, of, of teachings and practices which are contrary to what the church has always taught and practiced. And, and, and so it's extremely uh, dangerous. It would be a miracle if some good comes out of this. Even in his own country, Argentina, <laughs> populists are gaining ground, even winning the, the, the national elections now, campaigning against our socialist Pope Francis by name. So I would think you're a Catholic, you said, you're just defending really the Catholic life principle. The Pope, the current Pope is from Argentina. I would think he would support you. He has instead criticized you and you've called him a communist. Why, why the disconnect? Well, first, because the Pope plays politics. He has a strong political influence and he has shown a great affinity for dictators such as Castro and Maduro. He's on the side of these bloody dictatorships Wait, I'm sorry, Raul Castro's a murderer. Right, and Fidel Castro was also a murderer. Hope you believe the Pope has an affinity for Raul Castro? Yes, that's right. He has an affinity for murderous communists. In fact, he won't denounce them. No, I don't care what you think about this guy. I don't know what I think about this guy yet. But he won the election campaigning against the Francis Revolution in a Catholic country. Remember when Francis went after uh, Salvini? In, in, in Italy and was successful, he had more power, he had more clout at that point, right? There wasn't as much resistance. My point is the resistance is working. We see it even politically. Francis doesn't have the power that they thought he would, even in Argentina, a nominally Catholic country, Catholic country officially, right? The Francis could not pull it off. So Argentina, Pope Francis's home country, went to the polls on Sunday in an effort to elect a new president. Now, from a Catholic point of view, what is interesting about all of this is that even though Pope Francis obviously is not on the ballot, nevertheless, the Pope's profile and the Pope's agenda very much are at the heart 
of this election. <laughs> in Millet's final campaign rally before the vote on Sunday, one of his key allies stood up and said that Argentina should suspend relations with the Vatican as long as a spirit of totalitarianism is at its helm, referring to Pope Francis, and said that under Pope Francis, under the guise of traditional values, what is actually happening is that the Catholic Church and the Vatican are propagating Marxism. Now, as if all that weren't enough, let me point out that Millet's running mate is an Argentinian woman by the name of Victoria Villaruel. And Villaruel is also a member of the, or at least an adherent, of the Society of St. Pius X. In other words, legitimate contenders to run the Pope's home country include a libertarian who rejects the idea of state intervention in the economy and a Latin mass devotee. So what they are now, what we're looking at over in Rome, look at them, you know, aging revolutionaries, yeah, they're just not good at doing this anymore. They're clumsy, they're predictable. They're back and forth, they're all over the place, right? There's nothing attractive about what they're doing. They come out and they make a martyr out of a guy like Strickland who now has more power than most people in the Vatican in terms of populist power because Francis made a hero out of him, made a martyr out of him. You, you, you never do that. So why did, why did he do it this time? Because he's not good at what he does, because he's getting old. He's badly advised, he's clumsy, he's a clumsy revolutionary. It's just not attractive. But all the more so, it's our job to stand up and put these guys on notice. We kept the faith, we're going to keep the faith, we're not leaving the church, we're not going anywhere. We're gonna to continue to res resist you to the face until the day we die. And there's more and more of us coming and joining this movement every day. You know, all that is necessary, whoever it was, Burke or Pius XII or whoever famously said it first, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. So, good men, let us do something, finally. Put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the deceits of the devil, against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the world of this darkness, against the spirits of wickedness in the high places, and against, ladies and gentlemen, against Team Francis.